Rambla with Kevin Burke and Michal O'Donnell. James, uh, I suppose I might as well. The, there were three rails, and the first one was called uh, the Pigeon on the Gate. The second one 
was named after somebody called Lafferty, and it's called Lafferty's Rail. And the third one is called uh, The Morning Dew. But it's also known as uh, The Hair in the Heather by a lot of people. Um, well, so much for the rails. We play a few jigs now. Um, a lot of people think uh, there's just one tune called the Irish Jig. Well, we're going to play three of them, just to prove it, like. Um, the first one is called the Reverend Brothers Jig, but I have personal doubts about that title. Um, the second one was uh, apparently written by a man called Sean Ryan, and the third one is called uh, The Cliffs of Moher. So I think we're done now, right?
Thank you. Well, we'll do a song now. The song is in Scottish Gaelic. And it, um, it tells of this unfortunate uh, fisherman who seemingly spent a lot of his time up around the North Atlantic uh, working under very arduous conditions. And he complains bitterly in the song about the hard life he has to lead. And uh, the song is basically a plea to, to somebody or something. He wants to, he wants to go home. He's had enough. Home for him is the Hebrides. Um, I believe the island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides.
Well, we'll try another song now. This one's in English. So it tells of this explorer, um, a man called Lord Franklin, who in the middle of the last century took some 130 men and two ships and uh, their mission was to, to find the Northwest Passage. And um, they, they did find it, but it cost them all their lives. The ships got stuck in the ice up around Baffin Bay and they languished there for some three years before eventually they all perished. And um, there were lots of expeditions organized to try and, and rescue them and find them. And strongest amongst or most vocal amongst these uh, champions back home in England who were trying to set up rescue operations was Lord Franklin's wife, Lady Franklin. And uh, she was quite a public figure at the time. So when people wrote this song, they, they put it in her words. Um, it's Lady Franklin speaking and imagining the, the hardships and such that her husband and crew had to undergo.
his turn now. Yeah, my turn to relay a tragic ballad to you guys. Really? It's, uh... I'm going to sing a song about a fella who had a real bad time. And, uh... It happened while he was at work. And, uh... It, he had such a bad time he couldn't go to work the next day. So... Being, uh, he probably he must have gone to a good school because uh, he was uh, very considerate to his employer and wrote a letter to him explaining why he wasn't at school. I mean, why he wasn't at work the next day. And uh, the letter he wrote takes the form of a song, or maybe it's the song takes the form of a letter. I'm not sure. It's one of those chicken and the egg situations. <laughs> Anyhow, I learned this letter or song from a guy called Seamus Cray from a place down in the southwest of Ireland, uh, a den of iniquity known as Shirkin Island. Um, anyhow, thanks to Seamus for the song, and uh, here it is. <coughs> Dear boss, I write this note to you to tell you of my plight. And at the time of writing, I am not a pretty sight. My body is all black and blue, my face a deadly grey. And I hope you'll understand why Paddy's not at work today. I was working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear. And throwing them down from such a height was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't very pleased, he being an awful sod, and he said I'd have to take them down the ladder in my hod. Well, clearing all these bricks by hand, it was so awful slow, so I hoisted up a barrel and secured a rope below. But in my haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. <laughs> so I came down and cut the rope and the barrel fell like lead and clinging tightly to the rope I started up instead. I shot up like a rocket and to my surprise I found that halfway up I met the bloody barrel coming down. <laughs> While the barrel struck my shoulder as to the ground it sped. And when I reached the top, I struck the pulley with my hand. Uh, I still hung on, though numbed and shocked, from this almighty blow. While the barrel spilled out half the bricks, fourteen floors below. Now when these bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor... I then outweighed the battle and I started down once more. Still clinging tightly to the rope, I headed for the ground and fell upon the building bricks that were all scattered round. While I lay there mourning on the ground, I thought I'd pass the worst. When the battle struck the pulley and then the bottom burst, a shower of bricks fell down on me, I hadn't got a hope. And as I was losing consciousness, I let go of the bloody rope. <laughs> While the barrel then being heavier, it started down once more and landed right across me as I lay there on the floor. It broke some ribs and my left arm, and I can only say that I hope you'll understand why Paddy's not at work today. Again. Okay. As a child... I grew up in, a, in an Irish family in London and traditional music was going through a, a very low period. Irish music was going through a very low period. But my parents uh, grew up in Sligo, an area that's had a long, long history of being um, entrenched in traditional music. But they, they grew up with music I um, always had it around. It was just as much a part of their lives as basically what they are drinking 
milk out of, uh, not out of a bottle, but out of uh, a jug, you know, straight from the cow. It was part of, as much a part of their way of life um, as is possible. And so when they came to England, they, like anyone, they didn't want to change their lives totally. And there were lots of Irish people around, lots of musicians around, so they used to come and visit. And when I was born, it was natural for them to expect me to be able to play music. Um, then when I got to be seven or eight, they realised it was going to be sort of difficult. I had access to the music. There were lots of tapes and lots of uh, records. Um, as I said, lots of different musicians would come to the house, but uh, there was no one I could really latch on to, to learn anything from. So they sent me to music lessons. Parents' idea was, um, once if we can get him taught how to uh, use the instrument, because he's heard so much of the Irish music, that once he's got a grasp of the instrument, he'd be able to play the music. The music's in his head, because he's heard it all his life. So that was their theory, and it seemed to work to work out. But in school, in South London, playing the violin, as it was called, by everyone else except me, and the music teacher, uh, we always referred to it as a fiddle. An awful lot of people who don't play seem to think that a fiddle is, some, some of them think it's a different instrument. There's a fiddle that's used for one type of music, and there's a violin that's used for another type of music. But it's, uh, it's the same instrument, it's just usually used with reference to the type of music. Anyhow, to the kids in school, I was playing the violin, which was regarded as a real sissy thing, real weird, weird occupation. So that was the first thing, the instrument was, uh, made everyone regard me as a weirdo. But the type of music I was playing was completely off the wall. No one had ever heard of it or knew anything about it. A few kids in school had Irish parents and they, they'd heard about Irish music but they thought it was silly, they thought it was stupid, they thought you had to be stupid to, uh, to like it and the more stupid you were the better chance you had of playing it. And of course it made me feel a little strange but I felt I knew better because I didn't think the people, my parents were that stupid. And, a lot of the musicians I was meeting were amazing characters. And more, a lot of rural Irish people have a great knack of telling stories. Really good uh, at relaying information, even if the information isn't that important or that interesting. The manner in which it's relayed is great. And I, think, I think that comes from lack of TV and radio as well, because I know it's the younger people out that aren't in, into it as much the older people used to be. But uh, gradually it's turning, like it's not weird anymore amongst a lot of people. People respect the fact that um, there is a style of music called Irish music and it's uh, becoming popular internationally. So it's interesting to, uh, to see that it's becoming popular, but it puzzles me. Because I can't understand why it's different now. I'm glad it has. That's why we're here. me about the music is that it's uh, it's come from the situation um, it's come from the kitchen from the the, the kitchen the parlor to the concert hall and uh, it now has to be digested by um, far greater numbers of people than previously uh, in like 
previous to this, the, the only people who listened to it were, you know, gatherings of maybe up to 50 people, maybe 100 people at a, at a crossroads, at a dance, um, a social evening, things like that. Now it has to be digested by literally thousands of people, not only in the, in the form of records, but uh, also at actual concerts and gigs. So, in a sense, it has to be, um, it has to be doctored and tailored to, uh, to make it accessible to the modern day pair of ears and the ears that are used to listening to um, high energy rock music, uh, sophisticated jazz, uh, music that, that they never listen to but keeps seeping into your brain. Anyway, um, the, the, the noise factor in the streets, you only have to go out on the road and, and uh, there's so much noise going on. So like ears are, ears no longer pick up bird calls and um, natural sounds because uh, that life is gone. That life has been replaced by, by a high speed life. And putting Irish music into that context is it's very much like taking it out of context. Um, that's in fact what, we, what we've done with it. We've taken it out of context, and we're trying to build, uh, trying to build a suitcase for it, so that it can it can travel around the world and can be accessible in lots of different places. And I find that a very interesting thing, thing to do. For example, one of the tunes on our um, on our last album. The, the title track, The Promenade. Uh, a lot of people have liked Thanks that, that. Um, because it's in a, a jazz kind of idiom.
No. Um, no. This is um, a piece of mouth music and a few tunes after it. And the mouth music is from, um, again, from Scotland, and it's in Scottish Gaelic, a very close relative to Irish Gaelic. There are two branches of, uh, of Celtic, Celtic language. And um, it, uh, the words, while they mean something when put together, uh, they don't have a coherence or a, an overall meaning. They were used as mnemonics to pipe tunes um, so that uh, when musicians didn't turn up for house Cayleys or when there was no music available um, or as well when people wanted to remember a tune, uh, a pipe tune, and someone asked, how does this tune go? They devised ma means of, uh, of lilting uh, using nonsense rhymes, nonsense sort of syllables, and this is one such such piece, and we play three reels after it. We hear in fetter, full the man and made it fetter, follow man and you will not back in the matter. We hear him eat grasser and a hard ring. Not mad, it can't see it. Yell number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal, yell number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal. Had there she tapped in the show, had there she tapped in the show, had there she tapped in the show, we hear him eat grasser and a hard ring. Not mad, it can't see it. Yell number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal, yell number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal. They hear in fetter, full the man and rain in fetter, follow man and you will not back in the matter. They hear him eat grasser and a hard ring. Not mad, it can't be once yell, number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal, yell, number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal. Had there she tapped in the show, had there she tapped in the show, had there she tapped in the show, they hear him eat grasser and a hard ring. Not mad, it can't be once yell, number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal, yell, number one and born at number one and born at number one and born, but one of a fungal.
in the, in the south of Ireland, the southwest in particular, they have a slightly different style of uh, dance music. And uh, we'd like to play some tunes from down there. Um, there, are, um, there are three polkas that uh, we learned from uh, your man Seamus Cray, the guy I got the song from. A fella called Jackie Daly who plays with Dead Dan and and uh, a Cork singer called Jimmy Crowley. Three dangerous men. <laughs> Anyhow, some porkers from the area they come from is called Sleeve Lucra. Um, it's on the borders of Cork and Kerry. finish up with the next set of tunes. Before we go, I'd like to say thanks to all you guys for coming. It was a pleasure, and thank you. Indeed. So we're going to play a bunch of rails, and uh, we hope to see you again sometime. Thanks a lot.
Thank you.